Hello, my name is Mike Piankowski. I joined the UK Government's Nature Conservancy Council in late 1984 as Head of Ornithology. Working with many partners, including RSBB, we determined that red kites were globally threatened and fitted all the criteria for a reintroduction programme. We established the Experimental Red Kite Reintroduction Project and I chaired the project team from its inception to the end of its successful experimental stage in 1995. By that time we had established self-sustaining and increasing populations in the wild in the Chilterns in southern England and the Black Owl in northern Scotland. On the basis of this experience we designed a plan to assist the kite spread across Britain which we encouraged others to implement. 35 years on from the start of the programme, I've written the book telling the story of why and how we restored red kites across Britain. The whole project has depended on a lot of people, locally in the rearing and release sites, others throughout Britain and many in other European countries. I'm not going to list them all here, but most are acknowledged in the book. The video you're about to see is different from the book and focuses on just a few aspects. We are fortunate that Timothy Hornsby, the last Director General of the Nature Conservancy Council, instructed that we should buy a video camera, in those days a suitcase sized bit of kit, recording onto VHS tapes, and that we record as much as possible of the work. He didn't give us an operator. Fortunately my wife Anne had some experience with video and took the lead, with others of us helping all of us, including Anne, between main tasks in the kite work. The original video, taken in 1989-1990, was not edited until 2023. The delay was ultimately a consequence of the government closing down of the Nature Conservancy Council, coinciding with the first few years of the project, as described in the book. However, Anne has now rescued the VHS video, filmed some new material, not on VHS, and edited all. A well-known 1930s novel by C.S. Forrester, The Gun, was based on Spanish patriots in the Peninsular War of the early 1800s, dragging a British-supplied naval gun across Spain. It was made into a film called The Pride and the Passion, starring Sophia Loren and Cary Grant. We considered calling our film The Ladder, in view of the more modern ladder-carrying joint struggles of Spanish and British conservation allies, which feature prominently in our film. This aspect of the story works well on video, but I have to assure you that tedious descriptions of ladder moving do not feature in the book. We hope you enjoy the story that this film tells, and that it tempts you to explore the many other aspects covered in the book. Here is the video. This video is about what has been described as the biggest species success in UK conservation history. It summarises a few aspects of the programme of work described in full by a book of the same name by Dr Mike Piankowski and published by the UK Overseas Territories Conservation Forum in 2023. The experimental project, which established the viability of restoring self-sustaining populations of the species, was initiated jointly by UK Government's then Conservation Agency and advisor, the Nature Conservancy Council, and the non-governmental organisation, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, RSPB. The book credits as fully as possible the help of all the bodies and individuals who helped, but here we show also the logos of just a few organisations which helped in the early stages or recently or throughout. We thank them all, whether mentioned here or not. The outstanding success of this 35-year programme is a tribute to international collaboration, voluntary working including by many of the professionals involved and the contributions of a very wide group of individuals and organisations. We hope you enjoy the story. Red kites are amongst the most attractive birds of prey with striking ruddy plumage and amazing buoyancy because of their relatively light weight but enormous wing area. This allows for energy efficient gliding, twisting their distinctive v notch tail to steer as they search for food. In fact, they prefer scavenging to active hunting as it is less effort. 
they are essentially restricted to Europe. In Britain, they were a common sight in large numbers in both the countryside and towns, where their scavenging cleaned the streets. Because of this, they were protected. The nestling here is in its playing dead defence pose. Kites had numerous mentions in Shakespeare, including in A Winter's Tale, where we are warned, when the kite builds, look to the lesser linen. This is because of their habit of decorating their nests with colourful, often human-made items, especially underwear captured from washing lines. This proximity to humans became their downfall when attitudes to birds of prey changed in the 16th century. By the end of the 19th century, kites were extinct in England, Scotland and Ireland, with possibly only five pairs surviving in central Wales. Despite intense protection measures from about 1900, by the mid-1980s there were still only about 50 breeding pairs in Wales, their distribution indicated here in the Atlas of Breeding Birds of the British Trust for Ornithology and the Irish Wild Bird Conservancy. This population had extremely low productivity. Due to the poor quality of their habitat, very low genetic variation, equivalent to all being of one family, and illegal egg collecting and poisoning. The species was one of only three globally threatened bird species occurring in Britain. At the same time, the whole world numbers and range of red kites were decreasing, with strong populations only in Spain, France and Germany, as well as a small but growing one in Sweden. Could something be done to restore matters, so that the magnificent kites could again, in the words of early writers, swarm in Britain? If so, not only would this improve the quality of life, but it would also be a major international contribution to conservation. The then Government Conservation Agency, the Nature Conservancy Council, together with the NGO RSPB and others, set up a joint team to investigate this. It was chaired by NCC's Head of Ornithology, Dr Mike Piankowski. Within the project period, he became NCC's Assistant Chief Scientist and then the first director of one of the successor bodies, the Joint Nature Conservation Committee. He remained chairman of the team until the successful end of the experimental reintroduction project in 1995. The operational lead in Scotland was taken by RSPB, initially in the person of Roy Dennis. The operational lead in England was taken by NCC and then its successor, JNCC, throughout in the person of Dr Mike Piankowski. Both bodies were committed to maintaining the programme as joint throughout. For practical reasons, most of the material in this video is drawn from the English sites. The team's first tasks were investigations into the need, appropriateness and practicability of the proposal, legal, scientific, conservation and resource aspects, potential sources of birds, how to collect and transport them, how to rear and release them and the best places to do so, and how to monitor progress and modify the process in the light of experience. All these and more are described in Mike Piankowski's 2023 book. Here we illustrate just a few of them. A source of kites was basic. From 1989, Swedish conservationists made some available from their small but increasing population, and from 1990 so did Spanish conservationists. A small number of kites came hatched from eggs rescued from threats in Wales. Here we joined project team members and Spanish colleagues in Navarre in 1990. Collecting the kite nestlings was hard work, especially because poor weather conditions made this a poor breeding year. In fact, the weather was so bad that our Spanish colleagues considered that it would be difficult for each pair to rear one chick, never mind more. Accordingly, they arranged for permission to be varied so that only one chick might be left in some nests rather than two. This was a brave and wise decision for the benefit of international conservation. The kites were nesting in very tall trees, which is why we were carrying that ladder around. It took some teamwork to extend the ladder, especially as it had to navigate around branches. The team volunteered Dr Eric Bignall to make the first climb to the top of the ladder which was tied to the tree for safety. 
and then further up the trunk using climbing spikes on his legs. But the hard work was for nothing on this tree because it was an old nest not in use this season. Eric descends safely to the top of the ladder. Back on the ladder, Eric unties its top and descends. Lowering the ladder was an art in itself. Then the ladder and all the other equipment are carted off to the next possible site. So Eric heads up the next candidate tree, only to find that the contents of the kite eggs in the nest had already been eaten by a predator. This tends to happen when the parents are having difficulty finding enough food to maintain incubation. Predated eggs. Alfonso Senozian of the Navarra Environmental Service examines the predated eggs. Very good, Doctor. Very good. It's not very good, eh? So Eric takes his climbing spikes off. So the ladder with its team migrates to the next potential nest. John Halliday takes a turn as climber, but given the lack of success so far, climbs carrying little. You see that? Success at last. The nest has two chicks of different sizes, which he shows in turn to the team below. They decide that the larger is the most appropriate. Eric climbs up with a bag to collect it. Eric, with the chick safely in the rucksack, and John descend. On the ground, Alfonso and the team view the healthy chick. Our Spanish hosts kindly provided one of their facilities as a base for operations. Back at the base, to give each bird a clear identity as soon as possible, Mike puts a standard wild bird ring on one of the kite's legs. By special permission, these were British rings, as they would eventually be released in Britain. The loud click is as the carefully engineered metal ring clicks into its closed position. It sounds, even to a ringer, that the bird is being injured 
but its leg is not being touched. As Mike says, So, on to the next potential site. This time the view from the front of the line of the team. Back to the hunt, with difficult climbing on a very windy day, with a disappointing result as this turned out to be a nest of an eagle, not of a kite. Who's an eagle? What's in the nest, John? Back to ladder moving. Another long climb for Eric, with complexities so that a supporting rope is thrown up to him. In Spain, the ranges of black kites and red kites overlap and they nest alongside each other. Probably black kites in this nest, but probably they can't move. So there must be black kites, eh? Yeah, I can see. Ah, yeah, black kites. After a long setup and climb by Eric, we discovered that this nest is of black kites and therefore not appropriate for the project. A windy day and another challenging sight. Alfonso climbs the ladder to trim away small branches to allow the ladder to be extended. Eric climbs the ladder and the trunk. He reaches the nest to find it holding three red kite chips and brings one down. Mike and Alfonso check the healthy chick. So, on to the next site. The team unload the almost inevitable ladder from the Land Rover and set off to the forest. John climbs the ladder to tie the top to the tree. Eric climbs to the nest. As he reaches it, a buzzard flies off the nest. So the wrong species again in this raptor-rich environment. And again, much effort with no reward. It's a tough task being a kite translocator. Some nests were just inaccessible without unjustified risk. So well done to the kites on this one. Another forest of tall trees. The ladder is put up with some difficulty. John goes up and ties the ladder to the tree. Eric prepares and climbs. He reaches the nest and puts a chick in the rucksack. After descending a little, the way is clear for him to lower the rucksack with chick to John. OK. 
Okay. Okay. Red kites fly overhead as we move to the next potential nest. John climbs, taking a collecting basket to join a Spanish colleague who has reached a nest with red kite chicks. John lowers the basket with the kite chick carefully to Eric on the ground. Mike rings the chick, still in the basket. <laughs> and shakes hands with the lead climber. International cooperation. It was important to feed the young kites at this critical stage of growth. Dr. Eric and Sue Bignall take this on here. At first, some needed the food to be placed in their mouth, but they soon swallowed and most progressed soon to feeding themselves. There was one member of the team we have not introduced yet. That is because she was usually operating the video camera. Anne Piankowski is on the right of this shot. Despite the challenges, the Spanish and British team managed to gather 11 kite chicks and there was much interest from the Spanish press. <laughs> International transportation of the kite nestlings was a major challenge. There are innumerable regulations and permits needed, conflicting with the need to make this transfer as rapidly as possible for the sake of the kites. For the birds from Sweden, the Royal Air Force provided transportation built into the maritime patrol and rescue operations of 201 Squadron at RAF Kinloss, east of Inverness. One of their Nimrod patrol aircraft brought the kites with Roy Dennis, who had been helping in their collection. These pictures are from the first year of importation, 1989. We had decided that we would run the English and Scottish reintroductions in parallel. So, six of the ten Swedish kites in 1989 stayed in Scotland to be reared and released nearby in the Black Isle. Four of the Swedish kites were driven overnight by NCC's Mike Piankowski, here carrying a boxed kite, and RSPB's Richard Porter, here walking from near the plane to the Chilton site at Wormsley with feeding stops on the way to join one nestling reared by Dr Nick Fox from an egg rescued in Wales from illegal egg collection. For the birds from Spain, we had a different set of challenges. British Airways Assisting Nature Conservation, set up by BA engineer Rod Hall, organised transport, both for our team and the returning kites, here being boxed up for transportation just before we left the collection area in Navarre in the early hours of the morning 
from Madrid Airport. All the regulations applied also to the RAF flights from Sweden, but customs and immigration personnel were at RAF Kinloss by appointment. At Madrid and Heathrow, we had to work through systems designed for commercial operations, not for conservation projects, in which time is of the essence. For the first few years, we had arranged with the health authorities and British Airways that the kites would be carried in the cabin, rather than inaccessibly in the hold, as we did not know how they would respond. So, the back two rows of seats were kite boxes, with the team just in front. On arrival at Heathrow, the kites were looked after by the team from the Animal Quarantine Service for a few hours while we walked the paperwork through the procedures before transferring them to a car for the short journey to Wormsley and their longer-term quarantine cages. These cages at the English site were constructed to meet quarantine requirements and to allow room for the birds to start flying. The back, sides and roof over the platform were wooden, with a double layer of netting, outer of wire and inner of plastic. Similar cages were built at the Scottish site. The birds spent much of their time sitting still and growing, Body size increase and development and feather growth has a high protein, nutrient and energy requirement. Moving about unnecessarily at this stage is wasteful. One of the first things we did with the young kites was a health check by Dr James Kirkwood of the Institute of Zoology, here with Project Officer Dr Ian Evans. This included visual inspection, taking a blood sample, also of value for genetic analysis and sex identification, and mouth swabs. The birds continued to concentrate on growing. To minimise human contact, so that the kites did not associate humans with food, provision of food and removal of unused food items was usually through a small hatch normally kept locked. Public awareness and support are important, so we did allow some visits by journalists under conditions of site confidentiality, which was always respected as far as we are aware. On this occasion, Ian took the opportunity to undertake some replacement of the platform or nest lining. Most of the time was still devoted to resting and growing, with significant amounts of time preening to ensure good feather condition. The kite nestlings instinctively avoided fouling the nest by moving to the edge of the platform or perch to eject waste, in most cases with impressive range. When the kites were approaching fully grown, we attached individual wing tags, as Peter E. Davis is doing here with Ian. Peter had done this for years as part of his protection work for the remnant Welsh kite population. The scheme was integrated across Wales, England and Scotland, allowing individual recognition in the field, albeit with some difficulty. Peter carefully avoids the wing itself as he uses a flame to mount the plastic to prevent the tag falling off, but allowing lots of movement so that the flexible tag can act a little like an extra feather. As body and feather growth neared completion, the birds became more active, with excursions along the perches, termed branching, and wing stretching. The 35-day legal quarantine period takes the birds beyond flying age. Therefore, we built the cages large enough for the birds to practice flying within them, and they were keen to do so, also exercising their talons by clinging onto the inner plastic layer of netting. Just before release, we arranged for Dr Robert Kenwood of the Institute of Terrestrial Ecology to attach radio transmitters to the central tail feathers of the kites. This meant that the transmitters would be lost after about a year when the kites progressively lost and replaced their tail feathers during molt. While attaching the radio, Robert covered the bird's head with a towel 
because birds in the dark tend not to struggle. A card was placed under the central tail feathers to keep the other feathers clear of the adhesive used. We never saw any signs of either the radio tags or the wing tags giving the birds any problems. In the first year we expected, correctly, that the batteries would not last that long, but the radios proved invaluable in finding one of our kites illegally poisoned, leading to a successful prosecution. One of the outcomes of the work being a reduction of such activity, leading to a respread of other species of birds of prey. In later years, we extended the life of the radio batteries by reducing the detection range, meaning that the radios were helpful in locating nesting attempts of one-year-old birds. Just before the cages were opened to release the kites, Ian put food on new platforms placed on the roof of the cages. This was to ensure that the kites had a source of food while they learnt to forage for themselves, which they did within a few days, and were soon independent of this supplementary food source. In every year, the behaviour of individual kites when the cages were finally opened was highly variable. Some regarding the change in appearance of the front of the cage being highly suspicious. When Ian opened the first cage in 1990, the kites seemed to be of the suspicious type. Eventually, one of the kites flew to the forward perch, but then returned to the back of the cage. After a long delay, the second bird left the first cage. In contrast, as soon as a gap appeared as Rod Hall was opening the door of the second cage, both birds flew out through the gap, and those leaving the third cage were nearly as prompt. The practice flying within the cage meant that the young kites took to the air very easily and skillfully once they left the cages. The radio tracking proved invaluable, especially when the birds were behind tree leaves or distant. So, how did things work out? The videos we have just been viewing were filmed in 1989 and 1990. As you will see from the change in aspect ratio and the sudden ageing of Dr Mike Piankowski, we've now switched to 2021-22. Kites are now common in the Chilterns. They are readily mobbed, for example here by jackdaws. But this does not stop them foraging, whether by scavenging or catching earthworms or catching insects on the ground or in the air. In fact, Kites are taking off all over. By the 2007 to 2011 breeding atlas by the British Trust for Ornithology, Birdwatch Island and the Scottish Ornithologists Club, red kites are breeding across much of the country and spreading further, as indicated for the UK distribution of kite sightings in 2016 to 2019. The Chilterns kites have been very productive. Young from here were able to take over from Spain the supply to the third British release site in Northamptonshire part way through that exercise. Kites reared in the wild in the Chilterns have also supplied later reintroductions to Yorkshire and North East England as well as Dumfries and Galloway, alongside some supplied from the Black Isle site. And Aberdeen, alongside kites from central Scotland. The Northamptonshire kites provided young birds to Cumbria. Meanwhile, the Welsh kites, with input from dispersal from the reintroductions, recovered enough to provide young kites to re-establish them in the island of Ireland. In 2022, the Chilterns provided young kites back to Spain, whose populations had declined, but improvements in legislation and implementation in respect of illegal killing gave the opportunity for assisted recovery. So, here is one of the Chiltern nests with a well-grown chick. At this stage, the chicks need only occasional feeding. Well-grown chicks exercise by branching, practicing balancing and walking along branches near the nest. In fact, this chick is several meters from the nest when a parent arrives in the nest with food. The chick is clearly not suffering from hunger as it is many minutes before it returns to the nest, by which time the parent had left. So, clearly when the kite breeds, things are going well. This programme has been as successful as our most ambitious projections in the early experimental project. 
we thank the very many individuals and organisations who contributed to this success.